And the myth, the legend reels coming out with it, man. We'll see. Uh, do you think he can do it? Do you think he can bring back two straight games here? I think he can, but one of the things that he wants to think about this game, because it's going to be of paramount importance, is the fact that he saw Harrison Jones in that last game. So yeah. he's going to have to be very selective with his Assassin's Blade. Um, okay. You may see him actually try to bait out Harrison in the mid game with just a regular poison on a, on a Dacker. But even that still is pretty devastating. Like that, mm -hmm. it, it's still three damage and a card draw, oh, yeah. plus the mana that you have to invest in it to begin with. Um, and on, on Kit side of the board, again, this hunt, this warrior deck is built to be more aggressive than what you're typically used to seeing between these core prime elites. And again, Fiery War Axe being six damage. Like, he, what I imagine you're gonna see here is a turn two Armorsmith into a Cruel Taskmaster, and he's gonna start attacking for three right away. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be indicative of the fact that it, this matchup was built now this way to pressure this rogue out of the game, because one of the best ways you can pressure rogue is the fact that their life total it kind of diminishes really quickly between using weapons as removal spells, and at the same time, the fact that their only way to stave off damage, because they don't have any taunts, is with these Earth and Ring Farseers, and then perhaps a couple of Shadow Steps. But Shadow Step being a really crucial card uh, in this matchup, because it, how much damage enables the Leroy, you don't want to be using those on Earth and Ring Farseers. Yep, and I mean, you also, you know, speaking about the Harrison, you really can't discount, of course, uh, you know, the, the Battle Cries is so, so, so powerful, but the fact that it's a 5-4 is, is not, you know, it's still a decent minion being thrown out on the board. The battle cry is just kind of the, the icing on the cake. Right. This backstab is really critical here as well because it prevents two things from happening. Number one is it prevents him from being able to get this armor smith in for free. Mm -hmm. And then number two is even when this situation comes up, this cruel taskmaster, if he wants to use it on the armor smith, the loot hoarder is going to be able to take it out next turn. And if he uses it on the armor smith, also a dagger would be able to take it out. So it really forces Kit Kat's hand here if his play was turned to cool taskmaster. So Reel's reading into that with that backstab, is, I think, is a really good play. Yeah, for sure. We <laughs> look like Kit's got uh, computer was going a little slow mo there for a second. It looks like both of these players are kind of in slow mode at the moment. Yeah, yeah but um, anyway, he is going to just drop the, the Earthring Farce here and, and turn. Um, so, I mean, uh, for, for reels, you know, are there any adjustments you think you make because you know that he has a Harrison? Can you really play around that or do you just have to play your game and just hope he doesn't have it? What you're going to want to do with this, because I've been in this position before, is what I was doing is trying to get to the end game position where an Assassin's Blade was threatening lethal and it forced a Harrison Jones from my opponent. Okay. And then off of that force from Harrison Jones, I was able to push through the last damage with Leroy and Shadow Steps. Okay. So, when you're using it, there's two different ways you have to go. Number one is you cannot win if your opponent has Harrison Jones, so you have to play it and hope they don't. And then number two is use it to force a Harrison Jones from your opponent, so that way it not only can give you an extra turn to set up for lethal because your opponent can't use their mana to set up lethal on you, but also uh, at the same time, it, when you hold it that way and still use it, when your opponent doesn't have Harrison Jones, you win the game 100% of the time that way because the, the Assassin's Blade just deals so much damage. So, for sure. So that's interesting. Do you, do you think that then, you know, especially you wouldn't want to be using um, the hair, you know, you wouldn't want to be using your Assassin's Blade in combination with uh, with Deadly Poison? You wouldn't want to kind of combo it up? Is that just too risky? Well, when you do that, again, the point of it is just to force the Harrison Jones from your opponent. So that's you the turn. You don't think the Assassin's Blade alone is enough to do that? It is enough to do that, but sometimes the extra damage ends up mattering okay. on the lethal. So it's just a matter of, of how much mana you have to actually deal with it. And wow, this Cruel Taskmaster oh, is a really big draw because he played this 3 3 to threaten this Accolade of Pain and this second Cruel Taskmaster is now going to allow him to draw two cards and kill the 3-3. Three, three. So 35 health. This is another threat the Warrior has against this deck, by the way. He's just getting so far out of reach. He hasn't drawn a shield block yet. He has used an Armor Smith, but think about how many cards he's drawn already. And he's at 35 HP, and his hand is still, again, wow, and another Corcron Elite. <laughs> You're looking at, like, Corcrons into Azure Drakes, into yeah. more Corcrons, into Gorehow. This game has the potential to really end on the back of what is, again, kind of a low critical mass that you have to obtain when you're playing against Miracle Rogue. Yeah, and, and honestly, Reels has not been getting you know, the best of draws. He does have the double shadows and the prep, so if he can get his Auctioneer, if he can get some Leroy's and things like that, he can right. set up for that in the future. But right now, he doesn't have much of a board development at all. You know, there's, there's really nothing going on for him, uh, and he's kind of just depending on draws. You know, the Zerge can going to be dropped here. Um, makes a lot of sense, and uh, Whirlwind going to be picked up with that, going to be able to clear this off. You know, Reels, I'm sure, are going to be hoping to get a decent card draw from this, and we'll have to see what exactly he is going to pick up uh, as the board does go back over onto his turn. Right. So and this so is only the major... Backstab and the Assassin's Blade. This is only the major weakness of Miracle Rogue is when it doesn't draw its Auctioneer. Sometimes it can be extremely underwhelming. So this is one of those positions you're seeing where Assassin's Blade has to come down because he's just, frankly, not going to win the game if he waits because at this point he cannot play around Harrison Jones. Yeah. So it, it's like he's, it's only one copy of the card, 
if he had Harrison Jones here, I think the game would just basically be over because he's now he's lost nine potential points of damage and then even more between the, the uh, deadly poisons. Yeah. But instead, all he has to do is take this aggressive stance on the back of knowing that his opponent likely doesn't have an auctioneer in this spot. And look at how much damage, 10 points of damage. This is turn six. This is a control deck that's putting out this kind of damage. Yeah, and this is, this is real. Oh, oh geez. he gets it. All right, let's see what he can do here. Oh, oh no, this is really bad for Kit Kats. This is the draw you definitely didn't want to see. And now let's see. I mean, he's really got to work some magic here, man. He's got to, he's got to start pulling off some miracles because he needs to win two games straight, and he's kind of a little bit up against the wall already here in this, in this first game. So it's looking like he's... Um, uh, you know, gonna go for backstab. I like backstab into the four three here because if you draw something like Phantom Knives, okay, it's really good on your preparation. Okay, so he pulls out the Van Cleef. He does have the prep. Now, do you think he just is gonna have to prep sap something back? Is that what he was thinking? He's definitely gonna have to. But that, again, sort of more reason why I would have liked to see him. I guess he was he was just thinking he's just gonna have to kill the Corcoran Elite with Assassin's Blade. That's right. Makes but, sense to me. But now what does he sap? Well, he has. To, I guess he just has to sap the Zerg Drake anyway, and then. Uh, do the damage to the Corcoran Elite, so maybe would have made more sense to just actually kill off the Taskmaster with it back there, but it was already damaged, so he couldn't. Well, he can't, yeah, he can't. Yeah, so it was already damaged, damage so he couldn't do that. So, I mean, yeah, I agree, but at the same time, he wouldn't be able to kill off the Azur Drake right. that way, so this well, way he, he, he takes, is getting rid of both right. minions. So, it, like, the way I'm looking at his hand, though, is that he's going to sap this Azur Drake yeah. anyway, so it just kind of chokes out one of his draws from something like Shiv or, or Phantom yeah. so a slight misstep, perhaps, but again, he, has, he anticipated killing this Corcoran Elite yeah. with this weapon anyway, but Gosh, I mean, where do you go from this? It seems like the big thing is, though, from what, from what I'm understanding, is that he just doesn't, he wants to get both those minions off the board, and he doesn't want to sap a charge minion. Right. Right? So that's, if he gets the Phantom Knives, yes, your play would definitely be amazing. But if he didn't, then he's left sapping a charge minion or leaving one of them on the board. Ooh, so I think he really wants to eliminate both steps, and he's really just digging, man. <laughs> oh, that's a terrible shadow. That feels really bad, because now you've cut oh. six damage out of your hand. I actually would have liked to see him leave this auctioneer on the board, and there's two reasons why. The first one is because if, if it soaks up four damage from this core Elite, I think you're okay with it because you have a poison down on your Assassin's Blade. It didn't get Harrison Jones, so your opponent likely doesn't have it. You, you have 18 points of damage from Leroy. You need to force through this damage here, and you just lost six points of it, and you're taking more damage on the backswing now. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't... It, the Auctioneer just did what it... Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. He's one mana short, though. Ugh. It's still still kind of brutal, man. Oh I my mean, god. So Blade Flurry is going to be coming out next turn for sure. But in the meantime, again, still 10 more points of damage coming across the board. This is a really tight game. And you have to look at Gorhal. He, he, has, yeah. he has a 7 damage Gorhal there. He has, you know, his Zerdrake for a card draw. He has his Harrison Jones for a card draw if, if it doesn't get Blade Flurry. So, I mean, it very likely will, of course. But still, like... Reels is in such a horrible position. You know, there's only three damage that Kit needs to get to right. be able to kill him with the Gorhal. Preparation is one of the cards you need to draw in this spot because this Van Cleef is going to need to come down. But again, looking at Kit Kat's hand, he's got nine cards in his hand. Yeah. He's got so many ways to answer it if you yep. do, but you kind of just have to, you kind of just have to YOLO and go for it. You don't really have another option at this point. And one of the reasons why you don't have the option is because you just lost six points of damage trying to save your auction here. So uh, it's like it, brutal both, both ways. And even still, I think he made play the, the Van Cleef here anyway. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. Yeah. But gosh, so much damage coming out from a control deck of all things. But Auctioneer really pulling a lot of weight here, showing you that the, it's the difference sometimes between just absolutely winning a game and absolutely losing a game. He lost without Auctioneer. Yep. But now that he has it, we have an actual game again. Yep. And, uh, you know, a lot of ways to clean this up. You know, uh, I imagine he doesn't want to take the face damage. Why risk it? He could Whirlwind. He has two executes. He could theoretically Whirlwind double execute. I mean, do you think he's going to go that way? Or do you think he's going to, you know, there's a lot of ways he can clean this up. You know, he obviously can put down, he can put down the Acolyte, double Whirlwind, he guarantees three card draws plus the two executes. He can do that. He could go the Gorehowl away, but I think he probably wants to save the Gorehowl to kill him, and he probably doesn't want to take any additional damage right. just to be absolutely safe. So, I mean, if this is me, I'm dropping the Acolyte, I, I just, you know, Whirlwind, and then you do double execute. Right, I, I agree with that play. And one of the reasons why you were touching on is that this extra life total makes a major difference in this match yeah. because one of the ways you win, again, is just by getting so far out of reach that it's hard for your opponent to kill you. Yep. He knows the Assassin's Blade's gone. He knows that one Shadow Step's gone. He can just start calculating how much damage the Miracle Rogue that can actually yeah, deal. Yeah, Leroy Cold Blood plus right. Shadow Step. You're looking at the options and why risk letting yourself get in range right. of those. You know, e even if you're way ahead, why not just guarantee it? Because with the way that you do it this way as well, you can also armor up on the back of that. I mean, three mana for the Acolyte, one mana for um, you know, the Whirlwind, that puts you at four, and then you have six mana being used with the two executes, you still have the two to armor up. 
seems like a pretty nice play. Right, plus you have the two shield blocks left in your deck. Yep. So accounting for that as well. I, I can't really imagine not playing the Acolyte here. Yeah, I mean, there's no other moves that really make sense to me. I mean, theoretically, you could drop that Azur Drake or something, and you could still have enough mana to do the Whirlwind double execute, maybe see if there's some other card that you can draw. But I just, I just think that that's the obvious play. It's the safe play. You know, it's, it's the one that, um, that's going to clear up the board. You know, there's nothing else you're really ever going to need to execute. Like, what else are you going to execute against a rogue? You're not going to execute a, a Leroy or something like that. Right. You know, the Van Cleef is the ideal execute target. Again, it's an auctioneer, ideal execute target. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the holdup here is. What, what exactly do you think that he's really worried about? What, what is it that he's considering so heavily that isn't just making him do this play? I don't, I don't think it's much of a worry as it is just making sure that he's getting his sequencing down. Okay. Because sometimes when you get ahead of yourself, you just play things in the wrong order. And that can make a huge impact, especially when you have something like that. <laughs> You've never hurried through a game. No. But uh, so sequencing is really important here. And then there's also still a potential that he could play this Azure Drake and then just use a Whirlwind and two executes. Or he also may just want to well, sacrifice a Whirlwind it. as well. Okay. But I think I think Azure Drake's a fine draw and what he's looking forward to when he plays this Azure Drake, what to me anyway, now that I'm looking at it, is that this four damage threatens lethal next turn with his core hell. Yep. Makes so, a lot of sense. Um, you know, obviously the downside is you don't get the armor up. This is the more aggressive stance. He's been very aggressive throughout the game. Right. So, so we're fine. actually just complete idiots. Ignore everything we said. He was, well, he's not going to play the Accolade. It's not a simple play. He wants to actually kill him next turn. So. <laughs> yep. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, both are totally legitimate. You right. know, you know the, the play that we were talking about is just kind of the safer, more defensive play. I agree. And really, I mean, sitting as reels here, what the heck do you do? I mean, you can do the shiv with the Azur Drake yep. um, to clear that up, which is, which is pretty nice. But still, you're not really looking at, like, where, where's your winning scenario here, you know? It's, it's getting kind of grim. Yeah, because you're looking at... You know, I actually like using Phantom Knives here, I think. Okay. Because I think this one extra damage to the face matters. But he makes up this damage with a dagger, so it's not exactly lost, but I still think I'd like to see Phantom Knives here. Okay. Well, he's, he's not going to like to go with that, of course. Um, now, you know, once again, back over to the other side. Uh, we do still have that Shield Slam available. Ooh. The Fiery War Axe, pretty nice here. You know, do you think you just go with the Whirlwind Fiery War Axe? This is kind of a tough spot to be in now because on the other side of the coin, let's calculate the damage for a moment. So potential 12 from Leroy, mm -hmm. four more from Azure Drake, that's mm -hmm. 16 damage. Yep. Five from Eviscerate, that's yep. 21, and then one from this dagger, that's 22. So he needs to armor up here. Yeah. Um, if he fire your War Axes though, then obviously he's going to take right. the additional damage. But he can't just ignore it either. Do you, do you, like, he doesn't have enough armor to shield slam and kill it. Right. So either way, you're Gore Howling or you're Fire Your War Axe right. and you're having to kill it off. And I think you want to save the Fire Your War Axe for, for the execute, we've already kind of, you know, to kill off the rogue. Right. I think, I think you're going to see, that. you're going to see Whirlwind dig first here with this Acolyte. Okay. And then he's going to choose how he follows up after that. So okay. it looks like he wants to armor up and use... Do you, do you ever Harrison here? I don't think you ever Harrison here. Okay. And the reason why is because it, you just simply, like, he's got a two-turn lethal right now. He knows that without Earth and Ring Farseer, his opponent's not going to be able to oh. recover. Oh, two, apparently you do Harrison here, so... I mean, he's just, he's just so aggressive. That's, <laughs> that's the only reason I'm, I'm thinking that, because right. I was like, well, last turn, it's so obvious you Acolyte here, but... This turn, yeah, it's it's the aggressive play, and it seems to be what he likes to do. So this is what Kit Kats does, man. It's, it's not surprising me anymore. And now the Gromosh means Reels is dead next turn. So this is this is really just right. San, is San's dealing twenty four points of damage. Kit Kats is basically locked this game up now. Yeah. With this whirlwind, you're looking at ten points of game, ooh, damage from Gromosh wow. alone. So he's just gonna armor up. Now, do you attack the face with fiery works? I think yeah, you've got to out? attack. With, you've yeah, got to attack okay. with fiery works here. So then he's not gonna clear. He's just gonna go face. Makes a lot of sense. Puts him at twenty four HP. Puts uh, reels killed, you know, seven different ways next turn with the Gromosh, <laughs> with the, the Whirlwind to enrage that, with, you know, the Harrison, with the, the Gore Howl, with the Harrison plus the Fiery War Axe. There's like 10 different ways he can kill him. So reels must win this turn. We know he can't. We've already calculated the damage. I don't think there's any way he can do uh, 24 damage at wow, this he's point. he's actually got 21 damage. Yeah, so, I mean, he's just short. And how do you... How do you actually six, attack seven, with Fiery War Axe to clear? Oh, he, he actually, he actually doesn't have enough mana to deal 21 damage. Yeah. Between Leroy and Shadow Step, that's 12. Yep. Dagger up and Poison, that's 15. Yep. Uh, Blade Flurry, that's 19. And then, and then the four. One of the Blade Flurry deals an point, extra point of damage here as well. Oh, because the spell power. Yeah. But, oh, if he, he plays his have... Auctioneer, he absolutely can't win this turn. But he doesn't have enough mana he to do all those cards anyway. So. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Sap's going to come in here. <laughs> Sapping Harrison, not exactly the most thrilling point, but again, no. the whole idea here is to get lethal on the board, but this draw is not going to be lethal, and again, Kit Kats, he's got about 15 different ways in his hand to kill yep. him at the moment. So this is going to be game 
four over to Kit Kats. He's going to take the match versus Reels, who is coming off of a win here at Tavern Takeover. Yeah, impressive, knocking down the champion in the first round. And uh, how do you how do you anticipate he's going to do the kill? Do you go, do you go for the Gore Howl kill, man? Is that the most stylish way? I, or is it the Gromash with the Whirlwind? I think you got. I think Gromash can wait no longer. Yeah. Honestly, he hasn't come out the whole match. Yeah. He's been waiting for it. He's like, put me in, coach. <laughs> and it's like, all right, get in there, deal your ten damage. Everyone yeah. knows the Gromash is in there anyway, so. Yeah. Why not? Why not do it with a flashy win? Gorehal's cool, but it's no Gromish. Yeah, that's true, but it's kind of fun to execute the face of the Gorehal man. And it's exactly seven damage, so we'll see. Reels, Reels weighing his options here, uh, but he really, I mean, he knows there's a chance his opponent doesn't right. have anything to kill him. So of course you're going to play it out. You're yeah. going to be as, as intelligent as possible about it. But we already know, uh, you know, being the all-seeing eye that we are with the commentators, we get the advantage of having seen the other side right. of the board. And uh, not something that Reels gets to do. That being said, I think this turn is played really well. If, mm-hmm. if he's going for the assumption that his opponent can't kill him, uh, this is the way I would do it because this puts maximum pressure on the board. So if his opponent has a Brawl, it's going to force out five mana. So that's going to leave them with five mana left. Then you have a potential for one of these four fours to win. So the Fiery War Axe won't kill something 33% yeah. of the time. Uh, this play is fine as well because this also sets up lethal next turn yeah. because this Blade Flurry is so critical to it. Gosh, all these cards coming like one and turn you get the too extra late. Draw, so. Yeah, and just one turn too late coming from these cards, so too little too late, as we said. And then, just how does he kill him? This is what I want to know. This is, this is killing me. So uh, it's the options, man. We'll see what he's going to do. There's also, you know, the Baron Geddon. Maybe he could do it a fun way with the Baron Geddon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he could do the, he's going to go with the Gromash. Maybe he's just going to charge his face and then do three damage yep. with the Fiery War Axe. Maybe not even going to Whirlwind. Can wait oh, no he's longer. Gonna he's going to do it, man. He's going for the Whirlwind. Yep. And he gets pissed when you, when you punch him once, too. He does. Ten, Ten damage, damage in the, the face. face. That's a Pyroblast from Warrior. That's it, man. Kit-Kat's going to be able to secure this first series win. Well played called there by Kit-Kat. He's going to be able to take it 3-1 to one against Reels. Our first Tavern Takeover champion getting knocked out in the first round. And uh, definitely a disappointing result for Reels. But... For-